right. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started, started, started. Sorry, we're starting so late, but there we go. We'll do better next time. So this topic is how to get listings. And I know right now in our market, listings are king because that is the way we sell a lot of real estate instead of taking our buyers to 12 houses. So national coach Victor Vaca is doing his Breaking Through Barriers Masterclass. This series is meant for agents who are looking to level up. It is once a month. It is from three o'clock to four o'clock. On a Wednesday, we will have everything posted to Impact Worldwide. It will also be on the Impact South Carolina calendar. Um, just to introduce Victor very quickly. So in the news, keynote speaker and presenter on leadership to build your brokerage. Victor has performed more than 10,000 coaching sessions with CEOs, executives, sales leaders in three countries over the last eight years to 2X or 4X their sales. Victor is nationally recognized sales leadership and business coach who built two highly successful national real estate brokerages. He also owns three business and is passionate about helping others achieve their business goals. So we are so happy to have you here, Victor. Please take it away and I will grab a pen. Perfect. So Robin, thanks for the intro. Uh, guys, pleasure to be here, honor to be here. Um, so obviously one of the th things top of mind right now, interest rates are up, inventory is down. What do we do? We have a mindset issue. A lot of times happens, we move from abundance to scarcity. We got to make sure that we're fighting against that every single day in the mental gym, meaning you've got to do something to get your mindset right in the morning. You got to do podcasts, you got to read, you got to meditate. There's something that you have to do in a morning routine to get you to attract abundance to you. And so versus like, there's nothing to sell or there's nowhere for somebody to move. If you think that you're done. That you're, you're done before you even get out of the starting gate. So before you even get out of bed, we have to make certain before your feet hit the floor that you have a routine that makes certain that you guys are already on top of your game. So you start with, I know this sounds cliche, but you start with gratitudes because what you focus on expands and what you need when, and where your head's at. Like if you, if you get up thinking, oh my God, I don't know how I'm gonna make any money or there's no closings or there's no listings to be had or I have sellers that wanna sell, but they have nowhere to live and I have buyers that wanna buy, but there's nothing to buy. If you start there, you're in trouble. That's dangerous waters, guys. So what I'm saying is that we need to start with that idea. Now I'm gonna give you strategies here in a second, but I want you to start with mindset. That is number one, 95% of every single thing you're gonna do in your life, including your business, is going to be mindset based and focused. So making sure that you have that morning routine is excellent. Making sure that you have a nighttime routine is excellent. I won't spend a ton of time on that for the sake of time because I want to get to strategies. We'll have that in an upcoming section on how to work on mindset. But the point is that you guys get it from a general level, right? What are we doing from what are we hearing and what are we seeing? What are we spending our time focusing on? That is mission critical. So we need to start there. Now, once we have that part in place, we'll move into the next piece because then that has everything to do with your self-confidence. How certain are you that you can go get listings? Because if you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. If you don't think you can, you're not going to. And all of the strategies in the world aren't going to help you. We have got to start with mindset and we have to start with that self-esteem and the self-belief system. Maybe as cliche as it sounds, guys, I'm telling you, it's, it's life, period. So I have the honor to coach top one, two, three percent of NAR across the United States and other countries. Um, doesn't really matter about all my what I've done, but the point I'm getting at is the top people of the of the top companies and the top you know team in Michigan, the top team in Ohio, the top team in Maryland, the top company in any state. So what do I ask them? I want to know what is it that you guys are doing? And I coach them, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, annually, actually, um, for years. But you know, what are you guys actually doing? So I took a bit of a poll 
to see like, all right, so I'll give you an example. So um, top team in Michigan, brand agnostic, not going to get into that, but top team in Michigan, 587 sales last year with five people. Top team in Maryland, different brand, 712 sales with nine people. And then we can go on and on and on. We can go to Santa Barbara, California. We can go all over the country. Bottom line I'm trying to get at is what do these guys do differently that actually makes the difference so they can have that trajectory and climb that mountain? How do they have the mindset of leadership and be a difference maker? And not only in their own lives, but for other people. So I did a little bit of a poll. Um, I do that sort of, I just always take everything in. I mean, certainly I work on strategy with everyone, but so here's what comes back. Number one place to get listings, because number one, you have to have mindset. One, write that down. Two, confidence. You have to have those two things before you even get in the game. If you don't have those two things, you're not even in the game. So we have to have those two things. Secondly, database. This is the first strategy. Number one place. How are we providing that frequency of value to the people that are either past clients in your database, right? For So for the people on this call that are um, that been doing this for a while, you understand the value of database. People that are newer on the call maybe don't understand it. But I'm going to tell you, like Nordstrom's, that is where 70 to 80% of your business is going to come from, is from your database. And having a very specific way that you communicate with them. We'll talk about touch point strategies and all that later. But bottom line is I want to know number one is database, because these are the people that know you, like you, and trust you. Well, if you're knowing people, liking people, and trusting people, those are the people that want to receive your calls, that will return your text, that will respond to an email. Makes sense, right? So number one is database. Not going to get into a whole database strategy here because I want to get the overview of everything. We'll dive into this later, another call. Um, two, open houses. Now, so if they're not done right, it doesn't really matter. But if they are done right, it's huge. So when you create open houses that make sense, there's lots of different ways to do it. But let me just give you a simple way. So there's the idea that whether you have an open house, and I know that open houses are scarce right now. How do we set this up? Number one, what you're probably seeing or hearing, guys, if you're not doing it yourselves, but you're seeing other top agents do it, is they list a house on a Thursday, they have open houses over the weekend, and they have um, all offers due by Monday, right? Pretty, pretty standard stuff. But here's the thing. I have people that make the mistake of saying, well, the house is going to sell in one day. So I don't want to go through the prop, you know, the house or the, here's, and this is back to mindset, right? Limiting belief versus expanded belief. So for example, I'm going gonna, gonna to list a $500,000 house, depending on your market, that might be high, that might be low, it might be right in the middle, but let's just use that as an example. I'm going to use that as a $500,000 example, moving on. Um, that's going to sell in one day, two days. I'm going to have 20 offers, 30 offers, 15 offers, whatever it might be. Okay. So I'm not going to even bother with open house. Why is that? Well, because it's going to sell. No. Well, why wouldn't you want to do, why wouldn't you want to have an open house? Well, I don't really want to have an open house because then I have a lot of buyers and then the buyers um, don't have, um, if you know, well, if they get in there, you know, the, the buyers already may, may be represented by an agent, limiting belief. Could be true, but not true for all buyers. The next thing is what? The buyers also have a limited inventory. They can't compete. They don't have enough money. They can't go 50 or 100 or 150, depending on your marketplace, over asking. They're not willing to waive this. They're not willing to waive that. So let me just pause there for a second, guys. Do you kind of hear that you shot yourself in the foot before you even started? Absolutely. In, in, in a market like this, you have to turn over every rock. It has to be. all. This is a relationship business and a communication business. So we had to make sure that we're in more communication than not with people. And open house is an amazing way for you guys to be in touch with people. Regardless of whether they can buy or not right now, where 
are the people in their family or in their sphere of influence or their circle? Where is that? Maybe mom and dad, maybe the next door neighbor. Maybe it might be them. It might be not them. The point is, do not hide from clients. Don't do that because if you if you limit yourself to thinking that this isn't going to work for some reason, you already you already basically shot yourself in the foot before you even out of the gate. Next, geographic farming. So now this is a longer play, guys, for sure, right? And I'm not suggesting everyone should run out and get a geographic farm. But at the very least, farm the place that you live, right? Now, there's a whole section that, you know, that, that we'll talk about in an upcoming call about, I'll, I'll actually give you a two second uh, tutorial on this. So for people that are already knocking out geographic farming, awesome. For the people that are new to it, and again, there's a budget, there's a time frame, there's consistency, and the marketing has to happen. We need to have a CRM. There's a piece of this that needs to be systematic for sure. But I will just say this, what we're looking for is a minimum. If we look at, let's say a neighborhood, and again, I know some people are rural, some people are urban, some people are suburban, I get it. But we have to interpret what that means. And what that means is that we need at least 5% turnover. So to keep it simple, let's say there's 500 homes in a particular geographic farm. Well, 5% turnover on 500 homes are 25 listings per year. Just meaning that turnover is gonna happen systematically, automatically, it's just the way it goes, right? So we can do that, um, but make sure that at least where we're marketing to, justify the costs, right? So when we're gonna market to that area, that we know there are at least 25 listings coming up or 50 listings coming up or whatever it might be. And we can use direct mail, we can use Facebook, we can use, in, uh, we can use uh, Instagram, we can use many different ways to message to these people um, what the opportunity is in terms of the value. Number one thing though, I'm just gonna share with you is this is a simple little system to follow, right? We have to, we have to look at what they're looking at from the eyes of the consumer. What we have to see is proof of evidence, just listed. That doesn't matter if it's your personal listing or your company's listing. A just sold or just listed card goes out. Sorry for the, um, yeah. And then um, just sold card needs to go out. The home valuation needs to go out. I have a, give me an example. I have a um, client who's extremely well in Colorado. And oh my gosh, I'd have to think about her volume. She's about 110 million, something like that, roughly. Been doing this about 15 years. She's great, cool as heck. And one thing that she does, I think that I've never heard anybody else do that I want to give you guys like the little inside secret on this. She does a full-blown CMA for past clients. So instead of like home valuation, market updates, which are by the way, awesome. That's, that's probably one of the number one play, ways to get people to respond to you. But she goes a step further and she takes it to a CMA place where she literally does the whole CMA. And then people are calling her back saying, hey, this was interesting. Can you come over and let's talk about what this looks like? So that's another way to get it. I mean, if you've got, let's say, 10 past clients, if you're newer, if you have 100, if you've been around for a bit, or 300, if you've been around for a while, I mean, all of that. But a full-blown CMA is something to kind of think about, guys, if you're interested in getting a much higher rate of response. The other part, because we have to look at, you know, what else are we going to do here, right? And it's, 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 Agent to agent referrals um, are another way to do it, right? So another, again, that's going to be important. People that are in market, out of market, people that are networking at their annual events, et cetera, that's going to be a way to go uh, for sure. Um, the other things that I want to share with you is, and we'll get to a couple other things in a minute, but we want to talk about... Um, Something that I don't hear much about, but I have got several clients that do an amazing job with this. And I want, if you're open to this, 
I want you to really think about this. Um, it's going to be probate and estate attorneys. So the cool thing, I've got, you know, a few clients um, that are like, hey, you know, Victor, I know an attorney or two, or maybe I don't really know that many people, but I want to get into, and there's so many niches here for sure, guys, but, um, but I want to, you know, know how to break into this market. So to keep it simple for the, for the attorney piece is that we've got estate attorneys that are effectively hired to make sure that the asset is sold for the deceased party, right? So sometimes there's, you know, kids involved in this, but a lot of times it's the attorney that's running the show. And the cool thing is if you all want to look up how you find estate attorneys, just look up estate attorneys in your county. Send a simple letter. You can go get a designation if you want to, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the more educated you are, the better. And the more credentials you have, the better. However, you don't necessarily need that. I want to be clear with that. Don't make that a limiting belief like, well, hey, I'm not a certified estate planner. I'm not a cert. Don't worry about that. If Here's the only thing the attorney cares about. If I, if I give you this client, are you going to sell the property? And are you going to sell it quickly? And are you going to be in high communication? And can I trust you? And can potential family members trust you to communicate with you, knowing that you're going to get back to us? And that's really what they want to know. Are you going to service them and their needs and get the job done? So engendering trust is everything. It's huge. So I've created this system several times with clients where it's like, hey, there's a letter that goes out. Here's the 30 attorneys in this particular area, particular county. Letter goes out. I can certainly give you an example of that, but here's letter goes out, effectively specializing in state attorneys, understand X, Y, and Z, then that happens. And then what you do is you then treat it as an outside sales rep, which we are is in real estate, whether we realize it or not, we really are outside sales reps, right? Sort of inside kind of, but a lot of outside. So if we go to that attorney's office and say, hey, you know, and by the way, one little trick here, I mean, certainly you can go after small, um, like one person operations, male, female, whatever, attorney that's like a one-off. That's cool and that's fine. But if you can get into a law firm that does all kinds of different law, what ends up happening, you have 10, 15, 20 attorneys, doesn't have to be that many, but let's just say you have four or five, six, that's better than one. Because what happens is you get cross-selling going on. So we go in, we talk to the uh, won't be the paralegal, it'll be like the receptionist, right? And we said, hey, you know, I sent this letter. I wanted to follow up with Victor. I want to see if he's available to talk. And, um, you know, here's who I am. Here's my card, et cetera. You will be shocked at how often they will just meet with you. Then you can sit down and have that conversation. And then here's the question. And this is the ma magic question that happens and has worked for so many of my clients that has wanted to dive into this. And I'll give you results in a second. Um, so the question becomes, we get in, we're talking to the attorney, Hey, by the way, how do I get into the rotation? You know, do you have any specific agents that you work with currently for estate sales or probate? Yeah, I do. Okay, great. How do I get into the rotation? Question one, number two, after no matter what they say, here's the, here's the final and second question. Give me the next one, or can you give me the next one? Just one, let's test it. And most often what happens guys is they have files on their desk that you don't even know what's going on and they hand you a file and they say, okay, you know what? Actually I have one that came in this morning or came in yesterday and I've been looking to hand this off. You're gonna do a good job? Yes, all right, great. And then you go blow it out of the water. So that's simple. I'm just gonna give you an example of, of one result because there's many, but I'll give you one that's pretty cool. Um, a client in Phil, uh, not Philly, uh, Pennsylvania. And I've got ones all over the place, but I'm just thinking. So one, and we started this program two years ago. Last year, he went from one, one estate sale, the like year before and year before, just, you know, did onesie twosie here and there. 38 listings last year, that one strategy alone. 
literally. That's crazy, right? So, I mean, and crazy in a good way. Um, but we also want to, obviously, we want to call, look at more traditional methods like FISBOs. We want to look at investors for sure. Um, you know, I don't know if you, anybody has a strategy of working for the investors, but I certainly can help you with that. Uh, working with builders, again, fairly straightforward, but I, we can help you with that for sure. And networking. You know, a lot of the times I think what happens, guys, is we, you know, we become secret agents. Um, and I'm not suggesting anybody on this call is doing this. I'm just saying that I've been in real estate since 1997. And I see that what happens a lot of times is people don't really network very effectively. They don't join club groups. So it doesn't have to be Rotary Club. <laughs> it doesn't have to be your golf club. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be your PTA, but you have to join something. You've got to be in this business. It's a lifestyle. And we've got to be in a place where we're on constant communication with people and they understand our value. And it really is, you know, again, finding you know, your own way, because everybody's going to be different. Some people want to make phone calls. Some people don't want to make phone calls. Some people want to be accountable. Some people don't want to be accountable, right? It is what it is. But the point I'm trying to get at is we want to find a, at least three to five methods that work for you and make them work for you and focus on those things. So inside of that, you take your one, two, three, four, five strategies. Here's the five pillars uh, five, five foundational pillars that I'm going to work on to make sure that we crush it. Underneath that, what are the steps underneath one of those things each day? And then how do we take that and move that into a time block schedule? Because one of the things I find that happens, guys, is we generally spend a lot of people even top, top agents spend more time thinking about what they're going to do instead of just following a plan. So it's so much easier to just lay a plan out in advance and then follow it than it is trying to think about what you're going to do differently every day. And I think I'll pause there. Robin, you can pick that back up. Yeah, I love that. I do. And I, I've made a few notes. And I have a few questions, if that's sure. okay. Of course. So one of the things I thought of was um, I use the Miracle Morning routine. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they do make a Miracle Morning for real estate agents, which I don't like nearly as much, but they've got yep. that one as well. Yep. And as you were talking about the open house and all these agents coming through, you know what twigged in my mind was yeah. talk to the agents. We should be doing agent attraction, right? Find the agents that you like and call them later and say, hey, thanks for coming to my open house. So nice to meet you. How's your business? Tell me more. You know, we have this event we want to, you know, invite you to or whatever. So I think, you know, use it to your advantage no matter what. So I thought about that. Um, Can I comment on that one thing real quick before you move on, yeah. Robin? Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that because this is what the benefit of all of this interaction is, is because, you know, a hundred brains are better than one, right? Or even two are better than one, et cetera. But what you're saying, especially in, even inside of any, regardless of what brand you're with, but especially inside of the XP brand, the idea is that number one, regardless of, you know, recruiting or not recruiting someone, you want to make sure that when you go to present an offer, on someone else's listing, you have a relationship with them. Human beings are human beings and people trust or distrust each other. It's just the way it works. So bottom line is that the better you can ingratiate yourself and have solid relationships with other top agents in your community, the more often your offers are going to be accepted or pushed forward by agents. It's just human nature. Think about it yourself. Like if you know Robin, but you don't know Joe, nothing against Joe, right? I'm sure Joe's a great guy. I'm just saying, but if you know Robin and there, there's two competing offers, you'd be like, I know this, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I know Robin, she's solid, she's great, she's awesome, here's why. I would really, you know, think that this, you know, even though these are pretty similar offers, I feel confident that we can work through this and get this closed if we go this direction. The other person I can't really speak for. 
That's just the way it works, guys. You guys know it. Anybody on this call that is, you know, sells a lot of homes totally gets that. Um, on the other side of it, on the EXP piece of it, you know, just again, getting, you know, knowledgeable and friendly and, you know, connected with other agents, you know, potentially could be business partners down, business partners down the road. So anyway, go on, Robin. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think it's very true. At least if you have two offers that are like so similar, you know, mm -hmm. and yep. I think, I, and I think the sellers ask, so it's worth, it's worth saying. Um, I would add one of the things that I, I don't do it, but Ellen O'Neill mentioned it, that there's a program out there called Remind, which it's a paid yep. program, but it gives you people that have a lot of equity in their home. Yep. And one of the challenges that I'm having is people can't buy because they need to sell and, you know, that whole, you know, I can't sell. And if I sell, where am I going? And, I, you know, you can't do a home sale contingency. So having that equity, they can take a line of credit and they can go buy a house and then they can sell their house. And we don't run. It takes away that whole problem of how do you sell and buy when there's no inventory? I haven't used it, but she said she's using it pretty successfully. I'm glad you brought that up. So yeah, I'm very familiar with that system with Remind. And that's right. High equity is everything because to your point, there's at least two solid ways you can do that. And by the way, Robin and uh, Mona, can you please send me an email to remind me to send out a document to you guys to post as well on exactly what the strategies are that look like that? Because um, I've created a, a few things around specifically what you're saying. But two things. Number one is home equity line of credit, right? They either can cash out and go buy something else, especially if they're going to downsize from X to X minus 50%. They can go buy it cash or they can get a small mortgage, et cetera. The other big thing that they can do is a bridge loan. Um, again, they have to carry, the, they have to qualify for both. But if they have a lot of equity and they have good incomes, that could be another real great way to do it. And then thirdly, they can um, buy, I mean, effectively buy a second home, right? So if they have the equity to do that, they don't maybe even have to, you know, sell their current home. They can just, you know, cash out and move somewhere else. So it depends on, you know, what their situation is, but um, there's a pretty stepped out methodology that I've laid out and I'll make sure that you guys get that and make sure that everybody on this call gets that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I did have a question about the probate attorneys. Sure. Do you feel like we need some kind of experience in probate law in order to properly assist those clients or? No. You know? No, I mean, just think about it this way, Robin. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did I cut you off? No. Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, in my experience, that that's definitely not the case. I think that, again, that's back to... It's a great question for sure, but I think it's back to that limiting belief. I don't have the credentials. I don't have the qualifications. I don't have a probate background. I don't, basically all probate is, is somebody passed away and needs their home sold. So you're just selling a house, right? So now if there are some kids involved, which sometimes there are, and sometimes they're not, but let's say there are sometimes, well, then the, the attorney usually is the buffer between you and the kids, hypothetically. Sometimes the kids want to talk directly to the agent and that's all cool. But basically it comes down to this, understanding your seller, just like you would any other client. There's nothing special about probate. It's just the way in which it came to you. That's like saying there's something special about a Zillow lead. There's nothing special about a Zillow lead. It, they want to buy or sell a home. That's all. We would, yeah, we just have to like disclose that it's probate or something, I would assume. I mean, I don't know, but I'm sure the attorney can advise us on all of that, like timing and like, oh, do you need? Uh, oh, you, you work in unison with the attorney. I mean, so, so again, to take the pressure off of you a little bit, the attorney is running the show in terms of how everything's executed. They just need you to sell the house. Okay. That's yeah. really all that it is. It's not, you don't have to do anything. You have to communicate. 
you have to be available, like just like a good agent would, but there's nothing like super unique about this. Okay. It's just a different lead source. A lot of people had talked about divorce attorneys. Yes. Getting in with a divorce attorney. Um, yep. You know, you could have three sales, right? They sell and then they each need to buy. Um, have you met, have you coached it? anyone that was deep into that because I've done a couple of them and there's so much drama that it's exhausting. Well, notice I didn't bring that up on this call um, for exactly those reasons. I have not, uh, yes, to answer your question, I have several clients that have worked with divorce attorneys, but it's painful. Yeah. And, and so what I hear, you know, from my clients is that wow, they can't, the husband and the wife can't even be in the same room. He won't sign. She won't sign. They don't agree. And it's like, wow, like this is more than it's even worth kind of thing. And you almost have to be in that case, Robin, you almost have to be more like a marital therapist or something. And I don't, I mean, if somebody wants to do that, I am not going to dissuade you from doing that. Just know what you're signing up for. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yep. It's just a lot of work. Right. I want to make sure if anybody else has any questions that you guys have an opportunity. I have a couple more things, but I don't want to, you know, hog all the time here. Does anybody else have thoughts, questions? Is that Eve? It is. Hey, girl. Hey, I'm so sorry, but I'm trying to figure out how to use my phone. My internet went out. <laughs> Let's see. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Okay, so I'll just ask the question and forget about it or just have my input. Is, um, I use LinkedIn a lot. Like if you were looking for probate attorneys or um, divorce attorneys or anything else, I would suggest joining um, some LinkedIn groups and posting a some real estate information there and getting involved in, in that sort of thing could be, you know, different attorneys or I don't know, just different groups. I can't even think of anything off the top of my head except for probate divorce attorneys right now. Cause that's what we were talking about, but you know, there's like so many different things that you could do with sure. LinkedIn um, to get involved in, um, and network that way. Absolutely. I mean, thank you for saying that. I think a hundred percent right on. Um, that, I mean, all over it. I mean, so social media is, is a place to do that. Uh, finding groups to join um, that are, you know, in your, I mean, it, it, whether it's LinkedIn or it's, uh, whether it's LinkedIn or it's any other group that you're joining, um, even side of probate, you know, LinkedIn slash probate attorney slash estate attorneys slash, you know, whatever, we can look at all of those. Uh, same thing on all the social media sites. I agree with you hundred percent. And again, when I was saying that this, you know, uh, I, we always talk about when we were younger, um, well, at least I was younger, um, that sales, or that the sports is a, con that, um, you know, basketball or baseball, whatever, football, it's a contact sport. Well, sales is a contact sport. And the more you are contacting people, the more people that you are in groups with or affiliated with in some way, um, the, the, li the higher likelihood you guys have for helping each other with business. So even getting to the BNA meetings, which, you know, the business meetings where people meet, there's a whole strategy to that for sure. There's lots and lots of different ways to do this, but I think that to your point, uh, yes, that that's a great place to do it. LinkedIn. And I like LinkedIn a lot because it's a professional network versus a personal network. So, yeah. I agree with that. I think somebody posted on Facebook, you know, looking for a real estate agent to help me sell my house. I think there were over 500 people that responded in the comments. You know, I'm looking to help you or I can help or whatever. And I thought, you know, really? How are you going to choose 500 people? Right. <laughs> So, you know, having, instead of doing that, having that connection already, I think is, is key. Yes. Yeah. 
and I don't know our audience, Robin, because I don't know how deep people's databases are. So it, you know, it's very different, right? From high to low in terms of number of past clients and all that sort of thing. But th I think that's something that if you don't mind making a note on, uh, I would love to uh, address that on a future call. Yeah, I think that's great because knowing particularly touch points that people are using that's really working. I love the full CMA. Um, I think I probably have so many past clients that would take so much time, but even offering it and on a phone call or something like that would be um, something that is different. So right. yeah, I have, I, I love that note. I will be incorporating that for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, can you tell me with open houses, Mm -hmm. As far as getting and converting buyers, what do you think is the number one thing or a thing that you think is super effective in converting those looky loos into potential buyers? Well, I'll, uh, Mona, remain, remind me to send a script on this, but it's pretty quick and easy. But if you address the potential, you know, the, the open house attendee is saying that, you know, you know, for, 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 so thank you, you know, first of all, thanks for meeting or thanks for coming, et cetera. Um, but the, you know, what would I find Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so after you've had a brief little greeting, nice to meet you, all that, you know, people are typically coming to the open houses for one of two reasons. One, they either want to have a place to sell or have a place to buy. Which one are you? And go right to it, like get right to the, the crux of the matter, because as soon as you turn this into a business conversation, let me share this with you. This is kind of like another insight inside of why that is effective. So if you make everything too personal, and again, there's some effectiveness in that for sure, but if you make things too personal, then it generally becomes too personal and it may not be business focused enough. And I'm gonna give you an example. Hopefully it resonates with you guys, but I had, uh, a client, I ended up listing their property. Um, and they had a really, really, really good friend that continued to offer to watch their children constantly. Like you want to go out on Friday or Saturday, whatever, I'll watch your kids, watch your kids. She was never direct enough or didn't have the confidence enough or had the false expectation that because she was trying to engage the law of reciprocity that she was going to just like take care of them. There would be some sort of barter, like, hey, I take care of your kids. When you're ready to sell, you sell your house with me or buy a house with me. That didn't happen. They listed with me. So it's interesting because people will follow your lead. And that's why it's important to get your mindset right, get your confidence up, get your self-esteem up, because it's just, and you don't have to be like out of the off the planet on this, even though I see my background, I look like I'm off the planet. But the point I'm getting at is that you don't have to do that. It's just that have enough confidence to ask for the business. And that's what it comes down to. Don't be this sort of in between, you don't really say what you mean and you don't really mean what you say. And it's just kind of like, I'll take care of your kids or how long you've been in the neighborhood. That's really great. Would love to see you for iced tea anytime. I mean, that's nice. Don't get me wrong, but then right after they leave your open house, they're going to another one and that person's going to ask those questions and that person's going to list their property. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And yep. it's, it's, it's confidence for everybody, I think. Yep. Cause they can feel that one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yep. So I have a question on the database piece. Yep. Is there anything other than the full CMA that you've seen that people are doing with their database that really helps them stand out or is something different from, you know, the normal, oh, we're going to send an e a monthly email or a video or whatever. So the most effective people do the things that most people are uncomfortable doing, meaning that they make quarterly calls to their top 50 or top 100, okay. depending on how long they've been in business. 
Um, client events are part and parcel to that. So if there's one client event a year, that's better than none. If there's two, that's amazing. And what ends up happening is that when you have a client event, you have a reason to call them. So that's at least six touches typically. So there's a save the date. And, and then, by the way, this doesn't have to cost a lot of money, guys. Right? We could hire a photographer to do Easter Bunny pictures, you know, a few hundred bucks, like whatever. And, or maybe, you know, three, four, 500, whatever. It doesn't have to be like super crazy. And then it can be, we can do something at a movie theater. I mean, there's a thousand different things you can do. But what I'm trying to get at is that if you do, if you, if you have enough of a client database or a sphere of influence that you can say, hey, I want to have an event. That could even be at your house. It could be small groups of people. If you guys like to cook or if you want to cater, that's fine either way. But the point I'm getting at is you have to have ways to contact your sphere and nurture uh, that database, that, that those relationships have to grow and they have to deepen. That's where all of it comes from because once they feel like, hey, I got Robin or I got Renee or I got Jane French or Aaron Holly, I'm seeing on the top, right? Um, and so I've got that and he's a great guy. She's a great gal. That's who you need to talk to. Those are the calls you want to get because it's like, I just went to um, Jane French's house last Tuesday night for a happy hour that they just had appetizers and hors d'oeuvres and, you know, they gave us little gift bags and they talked about the state of the market of like what's going on. It was pretty cool. It was invite only. There were six couples, 12 of us all together there. It was, she's awesome. She gave us these cool things. You need to talk to her. I went to Aaron and Aaron and I, you know, had coffee or we, whatever. It doesn't matter what the event was. You have to be frequently in contact, ingratiate these people to you, build those relationships, nurture those relationships. So then when it comes time, you are top of mind. Yeah. Things to do. Lots. And I mean, I, that's a whole, that could be, you know, five calls by itself. But yes, you have got, bottom line, four o'clock PM, don't, let's dance. don't just hit, don't just hit email and database and set it and forget it. Don't do that. You've got to nurture those relationships. Yeah. And I think I used to hand deliver pies to all of my past clients, which was awesome. Um, I have too many of them now to really do that effectively. So I thought this year, maybe we could do a pie event where they come in, we've got Santa, we can do some Santa pictures. Um, so you don't have to go to the mall with your kids. Yep. Um, I don't know, get a guy to yep. play a guitar. I don't know. Mona, make sure that we, and I think Robin, we may have this together already, but make sure that we have the 39 touch point strategy that we can get posted as well. Oh, include that good. because by the way, I mean, which is annually 39 touches a year per um, person. Yeah. And that's, you know, more than three a month, obviously. But the point I'm getting at is what Robin's saying is, is really so spot on. And I'm going to tell you of all the things that my clients do from my experience the number one referral base is pie giveaways. Do not ask me why. I don't know if it's because it's Thanksgiving. I'm sure there's some deep psychological background to it. I don't know. It just seems to be the thing, even more so than the holidays post Thanksgiving. But get, delivering those pies, and by the way, hand delivering those is way better. Even if you do it to 50 people or 25 people, even if you have to use DoorDash to do it or something, right? Depending on how many people doing that is so much better than having a pie come and pick it up at the clubhouse. I mean, you can do it, but I'm just saying when you go to their house and you meet with them and they offer you a glass of wine, don't go to too many houses <laughs> and have too many glasses of wine. But I'm just saying that the idea is that that's where, you know, bread is broken. That's where relationships are formed. I like that hybrid idea, like hand deliver the most important people. Yes. Maybe your top 10 mm -hmm. or something. I don't have enough people to have, you know, top 50, but um, I think that's awesome. And then, the, you know, we can still have the pie event, but for those that, you know, deserve the very best. Yeah. Great idea. I wrote that down too. 
All right. Awesome. I have to jump to another call, but Robin, I mean, hopefully for the guys, I mean, there's tons. Wow. There, we could talk about this for a long, long time and put some strategies in place, but anything you want to know, type in the chat box, ask Robin, ask Mona, whatever. I'm happy to help you in any way I can. All right, cool. I've got one thing from Eve that says any advice to convert online leads. Do you think we might be able to do something on that at some point? Yes. So Mona, <laughs> I'm sure you're still there and Robin, you can too, but uh, let's do the cracking the code uh, for a, for a group call for sure. Okay. Love it. Okay. All right. All right, Thank guys. You so much. Got it. Thank you. Have a great Thank day, you. guys. Thank All you. Right, see you later. Bye-bye.